The Aristocrat of Amlagola. The title of this story will lead you to expect that the creature I am going to tell you about had nobility and fearfulness, and that he came from a place named Amlagola. But you might not guess that the story really concerns a very large tiger that had other characteristics which I am sure you will agree were far from noble. Very few of you will have heard of Amlagola, for it is situated in the remoter jungles of the district of Shimoga in Mysore state, and was only a hamlet at the time of my story. People called him, Gaundnorai, in the Canary's tongue, being a term approximately equivalent to, aristocrat, and he earned his title by his unexpected behavior at the time he first appeared in the thick forest surrounding the hamlet. It was rumored that he came from the jungles of Tagarthi, a place renowned for tigers and only eight miles away, while others said he had strayed from the Karadibeta tiger sanctuary, which he had deserted in disgust because his kindred in the sanctuary were numerous and the quest for food had become more competitive. The Gaundnorai, apparently, did not like this sort of thing. It was bad enough to have to hobnob with the proletariat of the tiger species, but when it came to having one's quarry snatched from under one's nose, as frequently happened, by younger and fleeter tigers, or the whole hunt thwarted and the prey driven away by a fledgling tigress, he felt it was time to shift to more select jungles, where there were fewer of its species and more game for him to hunt. There is a small hillock in the forest about two miles from Amligola, which borders the track leading from this village to Tagarthi, and it came about that around five o'clock one evening, woodcutters returning home along this path were surprised to see a tiger sprawled on a rocky promontory of the hillock, basking in the rays of the sun that had still an hour to go before it would sink behind the tops of the towering teak trees to the west. They quickened their footsteps. Everyone knew that these dense jungles were the homes of tigers, although such animals rarely showed themselves in broad daylight. The tiger they were now watching, although fortunately from an appreciable distance, was an enormous brute and, to judge by his attitude of lazy indifference, seemed to care little about their presence. They were talking loudly and he could see and hear them, but he continued to lie on the warm rock as he turned his huge head in their direction with the mildest curiosity. Thus, the woodcutters judged it better to get home while the going was good and before darkness overtook them. Against such a monster they would have no chance whatever, once the sun sank and the brief jungle twilight merged into gloom. Quite often thereafter, the graziers, woodcutters and forest guards saw this tiger of an evening, at about the same time, sunning himself on the same promontory and looking at them quite unconcernedly, as they moved through the jungle or followed the footpath that wound around the base of the hill on its way to Amligola. None of them remembered having seen a tiger do this sort of thing before. Panthers had been seen quite often, on the same rock, on other rocks, sunning themselves of an evening, but never a tiger. The larger carnivores are too cunning and too shy to expose themselves in this way to an easy shot from a rifle. Nobody fired at the basking tiger, for the very good reason that nobody in Amligola at that time possessed a rifle, while the range was too great for the ordinary muzzle-loading gun, a couple of which, unlicensed of course, were owned by local villagers. For the first few months this seemingly inoffensive tiger had been content to confine his attentions to the spotted deer and other wild fauna of the forest. Then, as rarely happened in this area that was so close to the western ghats and received a heavy rainfall, the southwest monsoon failed one year and the jungle became dry. The grass withered, the fields lay fallow, and the wild creatures that fed on the grass and the grain were compelled to move away to regions where a little water was still to be found and some grass for their bellies. The herds of cattle that had hitherto fed along with the deer and had not been molested by the tiger so far now found themselves alone. Nevertheless, this tiger was choosy about his meals. He left the herds and wandered into the village postmaster come schoolteacher's field, where he started by killing the owner's large white bull that used to draw his cart all the 19 miles to Sagar town once a week, on Shandy, for those who don't know Shandy, it is word used for market day. Not only did the tiger slay the huge bull with one slap of his paw and a twist of its neck, but he slung the quarry across his back and walked off with it in broad daylight, neatly leaping the six-foot-wide nullah that divided the field from the forest. The field was at the back of the postmaster's house, and the owner was in the backyard, washing his clothes at his little well, and saw the whole thing happen. He shouted at the top of his voice, hoping to frighten the tiger into releasing its prey, although this would have done no good anyway because the white bull was already dead. But, far from being alarmed, the tiger was not even perturbed. He walked majestically at the same pace towards the nullah, the dead bull across his back, 
jumped the obstruction, and disappeared into the forest beyond. The tiger killed again, and quite often after that, but strange to relate, on each occasion his prey was a lone, large bull or a fat, sleek cow. Never did he attack the herds, as other tigers and panthers had done before him, to choose and kill the first animal within reach. This tiger spent a long time in reconnoitering and selecting his victim, and it always had to be the biggest animal he could find, proportionate to his own colossal size, revealed by the immense pug marks he left on the fields and in the windblown sands of the pathways leading into the forest. At that time I happened to visit Tagarthi, a favorite haunt of mine, where I came to hear about the gaund Nora and his colossal size. As this animal was killing normal prey I had no intention of interfering with him, but repeated stories of his extraordinary size made me curious to catch a glimpse of him if I could. So I set out on foot one dark night along the jungle track that led through dense forest to Amligola, the rifle across my back in case of emergency, a three-cell spotlight torch in my hand and a set of spare cells in my pocket. I remember that night well. On the way, the beam reflected the green light of the eyes of spotted deer and samba, bobbing up and down as they tried to avoid the torch beam, the single, red eye of wild boar that refused to face the light but rushed away, the wide-set blue light from the eyes of a bull bison that stared morosely as I passed, the red-white light of a panther's eyes as they sank behind a small shrub and then peeped at me from over the top, and the pinkish-blue eyes of a sloth bear as it sat on its haunches to watch me as I padded past in my rubber shoes. Not ten feet away. I had entered the fields bordering Amligola when I met the Gaundnora and immediately recognized him, although I had never set eyes upon him before. Two great blobs of light blazed white-red like brilliant stars suspended just above the tops of the grasses that were swaying gently to the night breezes as they blew down from the small hillock. It might have been a hundred yards away. This tiger was, indeed, of colossal proportions. The Gaundnorai gazed back at me unflinchingly as I stopped to watch him with the beam of my torch directed at him steadily. We returned stare for stare, and thus we remained for what might have been the better part of ten minutes. Then the tiger did a strange thing. With a low grunt, and eyes still blazing into the bright rays that confronted him, the Gaundnorai started to walk towards me. No ordinary tiger would have done that. It would have bounded away. No wounded tiger, or even potential man-eater, would have done so either. It would have charged towards me, roaring in furious attack, or have melted away into the jungle, refusing a direct encounter. The Gaundnorai did neither. He advanced upon me slowly, inexorably, determinedly, a guttural grunt issuing from his slightly opened mouth as he came, no signs of anger or of fear upon his striped visage. One fact soon became evident. This strange animal, whatever his reason, was obviously quite determined to come right up to the torch and find out what it was all about. I must confess his attitude rather unnerved me. I had no wish to shoot the beast, for he had done no harm to the human race. But what he might do when he came right up to my torch and found a man behind it was anybody's guess. The tiger was now less than 50 yards away and still approaching, pace by pace, when these thoughts rushed through my mind and the reason for its strange behavior dawned upon me. There were just four days until Christmas and this was the middle of the mating season. Without doubt the tiger was a male, and a tigress was sitting on her haunches somewhere nearby, regarding the scene with admiration, as to her adoring eyes the Gaundnorai displayed his prowess and contempt for danger. Tigers can be very dangerous if encountered in the mating season in company with their newly found spouses. Their desire to flaunt themselves and their natural aversion to any intruder who disturbs their lovemaking, together with a fear that some harm might come to their mates, combined to turn them into creatures of destruction that will wipe out the intruder, man or beast. Then came the disquieting thought that the tigress might even be creeping up behind me in the darkness, in support of her mate. I did not want to remove my torch beam from the gown nor eyes eyes, in case such action might precipitate a charge. At the same time the possibility of the close presence of the tigress behind me left no alternative. Taking a chance, I whipped around, allowing the torch beam to flash through the jungle in a quick semicircle to my right, and then behind. Sure enough, that was exactly where the tigress was. She was seated on her haunches, like a great big cat, directly behind me, awaiting the oncoming of her mate. The reason for the tiger's strange behavior was evident enough after that. He had been approaching the tigress when I had happened to move between him, and the mating urge had been too strong to deflect him from his purpose. 
I had no illusions about what he would do when he found me standing between him and his girlfriend. It was time to get the hell out of there. This I proceeded to do forthwith, and with dispatch, by stepping sideways as rapidly and as silently as possible, while still keeping the torch beam directed upon the tiger. The Gantnorai halted abruptly and his grunt turned into a loud growl. What was worse, I could hear the tigress growling behind me. It seemed that a concerted attack was imminent. With my left arm I unslung the loaded rifle, slipped the butt into my shoulder, and pressed the button of the other torch that was clamped to the barrel of the weapon, using my thumb for the purpose. The two beams shone together for a moment as I prepared to slip the three cell torch into my trouser pocket prior to placing my right forefinger upon the trigger. Perhaps it was the two torches, shining together, that averted disaster. Maybe the Gaunnorai did not like the sight, and the potential danger revealed by the presence of a second light appearing so suddenly where a moment before, there had been only one. With a series of snarls he bounced obliquely forward in the general direction of his mate, and understanding the situation, I followed his movements with both torches still alight. As soon as he had reached her, the two animals turned to face me. Now two pairs of white-red eyes glared back at me resentfully. Then I began to pace backwards in order to escape. Easier said than done, indeed. Have you ever tried to walk backwards, in pitch darkness along a twisting footpath, through heavy grass and jungle, with a rifle balanced awkwardly against your shoulder in your left hand, your thumb pressing against a torch switch, and another torch held in your right hand, which is also helping to keep the rifle in place, while a pair of mating and naturally resentful tigers confront you. I succeeded in the maneuver for a short distance and then, as the two tigers had shown no inclination to follow me, I whisked around in order to hurry along the footpath for a few seconds and afterwards whisked back again to see what the tigers were doing. They were in the same positions, obviously glad that I was departing. Soon I reached Amligola and the hut of the headman, who was my friend, where I related my adventure. Ramia, the headman, was a widower and invited me to spend the rest of the night with him. Perhaps in daylight I could study the tigers under better conditions, he suggested. Along with numerous mugs of milk, and some rather stale verdace, small pungent cakes, that he offered me, Ramia and I began to chat, but it was not long before loud roaring and growling from the forest told us that the tigers had begun their mating in right earnest. The din continued for quite a while. Then there was a period of silence, after which the noises started all over again. This sort of thing continued till we fell asleep. Next morning I was in no hurry to investigate, for I knew that both would be resting after their strenuous mating sessions and my appearance too early might precipitate a showdown. Besides, I was feeling inordinately sleepy after the rather restless night I had spent in Ramaya's hut. It was nearly ten in the morning when I awoke and, after another bout with Ramaya's now tough verdace, followed by at least three cups of coffee which, rather than the tea that I would have much preferred, is the normal beverage of the cannery's villager, I prepared to investigate the scene of the previous night's noisy mating. Ramir excused himself from accompanying me on the plea of urgent field work, so I set out alone. The spot whence the noises had come, when at last I located it, maybe a little over a furlong away, revealed the energy that the two tigers had put into their lovemaking. Although fairly hard at this time of the year, the earth was scored and dug up in clods, the smaller shrubs having been ripped from the soil, roots and all, by the antics of the gambling beasts. From this place the ground dropped into a densely vegetated ravine, where scratchings upon the bark of a tree, along with freshly shed dung which, unlike the panther, the tiger leaves exposed rather than covered with earth, indicate the way the lovers had entered the ravine. Curiosity prompted me to follow, although I knew that what I was doing was rash. So with rifle at the ready and eyes that endeavored to see through and behind every bush, I advanced in silence, taking care my rubber-soled shoes did not tread upon any dry leaf or twig. No sooner was I in the shadow of the large trees that grew in this hollow than the sweetish stench of death was borne to my nostrils and I knew I was approaching an animal that had been killed. A few yards farther, and I found it. The partial remains of a huge wild sow that had been slain by the Gaunnorai and upon which the two tigers had feasted hungrily, for tigers love pork. Although a sow, the pig had put up a fight, as could be seen by her hoof marks in the ground. I did not examine the sow very carefully, for you may be sure I was watching all around me against being surprised by one or the other of the terrifying lovers, and it was while I was doing this that I caught a glimpse of something white that showed through the leaves of a jungle plum bush, 
perhaps 30 yards away. I approached this object, and it turned out to be the pelvis bone of a sambar doe also half eaten by the tigers during their spree the night before. There was no means of knowing which of the two animals, the sow or the sambar, had been killed first, but it was clear that the latter had been slain some distance away and then brought to the spot by the Gandlori for the benefit of his mate, for no wild animal would have come anywhere near a spot where a kill had already been made. The presence of the three crows, flying down from a branch to the earth and up again, betrayed a third kill slightly farther away. The fact that the crows were flying to the ground indicated that neither of the tigers was near. This kill turned out to be a spotted stag which the Gandlori had also brought to the ravine after killing it elsewhere. Little of the stag had been devoured, for by this time the tigers were too stuffed with food to do more than sample the meat. But I had not finished yet with finding kills. In fact, I tripped over the carcass of another sambar doe that lay most halfway between the carcass of the spotted deer and the sow. There was little left of this sambar, most of it having been devoured by the tigers. I was almost certain now that this sambar, and not the sow, as I had thought, had been the first of the four victims. The sow had followed next, her hoof marks on the ground showing she had fought before she had been killed. She ought not to have come near the dead sambar, perhaps one of the tigers had chased her there. The other sambar and the spotted stag had been carried to the spot later, for nowhere had I seen any traces of drag marks upon the ground, which made clear that the tiger had carried his victims, one at a time, across his back. If I needed further proof of his size, here it was indeed. There is a strange satisfaction in reasoning out the facts of apparent jungle mystery, and I felt this as I reached my conclusion. The ravine was, in fact, a veritable charnel house, the stench of death hung heavy in the air, and suddenly I grew afraid. Something warned me that I was being watched. I took a quick pace to the rear to bring my back against a tree and so shield myself against attack from behind. Then I began to scan every bush and tree trunk in the immediate vicinity. Not a breath of air stirred in the forest that grew hotter with the passing hours, as the sun climbed higher into a cloudless sky, although I could not see it at that moment because of the trees. Not a whisper of sound broke the stillness, even the two cicadas that had been calling from trees higher up the banks of the ravine were now silent. The crows had seen me and watched the scene with mute expectation, heads cocked slightly to one side, beaks partly open and panting with the heat. It was as if the jungle lay in breathless suspense, awaiting the next act in the drama that was about to be played at any instant. Out of the corner of my eye I saw a tuft of grass, frail and feathery, suddenly sway for an instant and then become still. It had no business to sway on that breathless forenoon, unless something had pressed against the stem near to the ground. The something must be one of the tigers. Most tigers, even a man-eater, will hesitate to attack if it feels that a man has discovered its presence. It prefers to have the element of surprise on its side. I knew this from my own experience, so I opened my eyes as wide as possible and stared hard at the spot where the grass had just moved. This would tell the tiger I had discovered where it was hiding. For a moment I could see nothing. Then two black protuberances, tipped white behind, seemed to rise slowly from beyond the grass, and I knew that I was looking at a tiger's ears. An instant later, the animal raised its head a fraction higher and I was gazing into the baleful eyes of one of the tigers. I knew it was the female. Her head was too small to belong to a male of her mate's size. That left the tiger to be contended with. He was probably in hiding at the moment, I knew not where. Gathering courage for a sudden onslaught, if for no other reason than to prove to the tigress, who was watching closely, what a great brave creature he was. Nothing happened while the tigress continued to peep at me over the top of the grass, and after a while I began to hope that she was alone. Maybe her mate had gone to look for a fifth victim. It must have been ten minutes later when the tigress began to make a peculiar sort of noise. I might say she was mewing, but it was too guttural and hoarse a sound for that word to convey. She was summoning her mate. As she had not attacked me all this while, it was clear that the tigress, by herself, lacked the courage. What would happen when the tiger arrived would be quite another thing. I decided that discretion was the better part of valor and I slipped behind the tree trunk that I had stood against all this while. Then I started to back away. The next moment a loud roar from the top of the ravine behind me told me I was too late. The Gandnorai had arrived. Something in his mate's mewing call seemed to warn him that all was not well. I could hear him crashing through the dead leaves and undergrowth now, 
coming directly towards me at the gallop. I am far from being a good climber, but sheer funk lent me agility and I dragged myself up the tree with commendable speed, the rifle hanging on my shoulder. The first fork was hardly eight feet from the ground. I reached it and tried to climb higher, when the rifle slipped awkwardly from my shoulder down to the crook of my arm. I hitched it up again, and just as fast it slipped down once more. The Gant nor I arrived at the base of my tree and my movements made him look upwards and see me. I decided I must face him and bring the rifle from the crook of my arm to my shoulder. I expected him to make a bound at me at once, but strangely enough he did nothing of the kind. He crouched on the ground instead, looked up, and snarled and snarled and snarled. Rather foolishly, as I think of it now, I changed my mind and decided to try to climb higher, but in any case I could not go very far. I managed another seven feet perhaps when I found I had gone as high as the thinning branches would permit. At this juncture, the tigress, confident of the protection offered by her mate, emerged and advanced towards him in gambling leaps till the two of them were together barely fifteen feet below. I hoped that neither of the tigers would try to follow me, as the bow to which I was precariously clinging was too frail to support any additional weight, while by my own foolishness in ascending higher I had put myself in a nasty plight. I was obliged to cling to the branch with both my hands and knees, and this prevented any possibility of using my rifle, which I could not unsling, since I would fall from the tree if let go my hold. Moreover, the strain on the muscles of my hands and legs was tremendous, and I could not possibly maintain the position for long. It occurred to me that I might try to shoo the tigers away by shouting aloud. The ruse would probably succeed, but again it might not. The sound of my voice might irritate the animals, particularly the tiger, who till now had behaved like a gentleman. The two tigers settled the matter after a few minutes, as if by mutual consent, when they calmly walked away side by side. Allowing another five minutes to pass, I descended cautiously, but there was no sign of either animal even after I climbed the bank of the nullah and started walking to the village. I really owe the Gaundnorai and his mate a debt for sparing my life. Shortly afterwards I was trudging back to Tagarthi, thinking I had heard, and seen, the last of the tiger. But as I was soon to discover, that thought was entirely wrong. Hardly had I been a month in Bangalore when the headman of Amlagola, with whom I had spent the night listening to the Gaundnorai and his mate, wrote me a postcard which he had tramped all the way to Tagarthi to post, informing me that the big tiger was growing overbold and begging me to come and shoot him. It was only a matter of time, he said, before the Gandnorai would turn man-eater. I oppose hunting tigers that have not molested man, and I was not going to accept the headman's fear of something that had not yet happened. The Gandnorai might never become a man-eater and I had certainly no justification for shooting an animal that had spared my life on two occasions. It happened that I had a few days to spare and could think of no more pleasant occupation than trying to see my benefactor, the huge tiger, once again. But things had changed by the time I reached Amlagola, although it was only a matter of a few days since Ramia had written. The big tiger had grown bolder indeed, killing more of the village's choice cattle. Ramia had already lost his best bull, and now the Gandnorai saw it fit to slay his second best. This was too much for the already exhausted patience of the headman. Disdaining to wait for my arrival, Ramia journeyed to the town of Kumsi, about twenty miles away, borrowed his cousin's point one tube or shotgun, and sat up to ambush the tiger when he next visited the outskirts of Amlagola in search of prize cattle. Having succeeded so many times before, the Gandnorai walked into the trap all unsuspectingly, to receive a charge of slugs full in his face from Ramia's borrowed weapon. The tiger then dashed away roaring terribly as he went. So great was his anger, caused by the wound, that he entirely demolished a bamboo platform erected by the villagers on a field from which to drive away the birds that fed upon the grain, and which stood in the tiger's path as he rushed back to the forest. All the day and night, and throughout the two nights that followed, Ramia and his companions were forced to listen to the pain-racked roars of the wounded tiger as he voiced his woe and anger to the jungle at large while they cowered within their huts. Unaware of what had happened, as nobody told me anything at Tagarthi, I arrived late in the evening of the fifth day at Amlagola, having walked through the jungle in blissful ignorance for eight miles without hearing or seeing a thing. We did not hear the tiger that night, but the morning of the sixth day brought the first result of Ramaya's ill-timed shot. It was just after nine o'clock and I was about to set out on my return journey to Tagarthi, 
when a man staggered into Amlagola and fell exhausted in the one lane that formed the main village street. He said that he and another man had started out from the village of Cordy, which was some miles away, just before dawn, and had been traveling to Amlagola when, about two miles from their destination, they had seen a tiger following. Accustomed to tigers and not knowing that the Gaunnorai had been wounded, they were not unduly perturbed, but decided to keep a sharp lookout behind them as they walked. For the next two or three hundred yards they saw nothing. Then they glimpsed the tiger, and this time he was not more than thirty yards behind them. Sensing that the animal was bent upon mischief, the two men had broken into a run, whereupon the tiger roared and charged them. The man who had staggered into Amlagola had escaped merely because he happened to be the faster runner. He told how the tiger had quickly caught up with his companion, who was racing just a yard or so behind. His friend's dying scream had compelled him to look back over his shoulder and the lucky woodcutter affirmed that the sight he had seen would remain in his memory forever. The tiger's countenance had been dreadful to behold. It was badly mangled and a mass of blood. He did not think the animal had any eyes left. Its ferocity vented upon the victim it had just seized, was truly awful. Not daring to look back any longer, the man had raced to Amligola for all he was worth, to reach its shelter utterly exhausted. The wounded Gandnorai had killed its first victim. To judge by what we had heard, Ramaya's slugs had blinded the unfortunate beast. Without delay, I hurried to the place where the attack had been launched, Ramia and the surviving woodcutter reluctantly accompanying me. The tiger must have been ravenously hungry, he had eaten the most of his victim on the spot. Then he must have heard us coming, for he had carried away what remained as he dashed into the undergrowth, perhaps only a matter of minutes before our arrival. We knew the tiger had eaten well, for his victim's head, hands and feet lay scattered about, a sure sign of a hearty meal. The trail was fresh, but the undergrowth was extremely lush. Ramia and the woodcutter were canneries and not of the stuff of jungle men and trackers. They flatly refused to come any farther, so I followed by way of the broken weeds and the bent branches of his victim. It was difficult to watch ahead and both sides against a surprise attack while moving fast at the same time. The Gaunnorai, for all his size, did not stop to fight it out. Probably his recent wound, and the pain he was suffering, made him reluctant to risk an encounter with another armed man. It is uncanny how a wild animal is able to sense the presence of a human being who may spell danger and distinguish him from one who is helpless, unarmed, or bears no hostile thoughts. The trail led through the belt of thick forest into lighter scrub, where it was more difficult to proceed, and then down a steep decline where the tiger had finally jumped into a narrow ravine, more a watercourse than anything else. Here I had to go down on hands and knees and within a few yards it became too dense to go farther. In any event, pursuit was fruitless as I could never hope to overtake my quarry under such conditions. Disappointed as I was, two facts were now established beyond any doubt. Firstly, the Gantnorai had not been totally blinded by Ramaya's pellets. Therefore he remained a very real danger to the human race and would continue to be so till he completely recovered from his wounds and went back again to killing cattle and wild game. That was extremely unlikely to happen, however, as once a tiger has tasted human flesh and comes to realize how easy it is to kill a man, it rarely abandons the habit. In other words, here was a man-eater at the beginning of his dreadful career. Secondly, despite his enormous size, this tiger did not have a fighting heart so he was likely to prove more cowardly, cunning, elusive and much more difficult to bring to book than most ordinary tigers, normally more daring and so liable to expose themselves. How correct both my surmises were was revealed in a comparatively short time. My visit to Amligola could not be prolonged as I had to return to work to the aircraft plant in which I was employed at that time. So leaving instructions with Ramia to keep me closely informed of events as they occurred, I returned to Bangalore the following morning. It did not take long for Ramia to write again. He related that the Gandnorai had turned into a dangerous and elusive brute. No longer did he sun himself on the slopes of the small hillock, in full view of every passerby. Now there was no sight of him, no sound to be heard. Only his huge, saucer-sized pug marks betrayed his passing, and with each such visit some traveler, who had set out on a journey, failed to reach his destination. Ramia said that the tiger had taken to haunting the most lonely section of the footpath leading from Amligola to Tagathi, 
from where he would snatch the last of a group of travelers. Apparently this had happened on three occasions, and now people shunned this track. They preferred to walk 25 miles by a circular route to Tagarthi. Having covered the shortcut many times myself, I knew exactly the spot to which Ramia referred. It was a dip through a valley running between two low hills, where the vegetation consisted of tall bamboos and fairly heavy evergreen scrub that provided ideal cover in which a tiger could spring an ambush upon a group of passes by. I left for Tagarthi the next day, parked the car at the rest house of the forest department that stood in a beautifully wooded setting a mile away, and set out to cover the eight-mile footpath to Amlagola, which would lead through what had become the Valley of Death, in which the Gandnorai launched his attacks. It was exactly two in the afternoon when I started, and it was a cloudy, cool day. The conditions for a tiger to be early afoot were ideal. I would have to progress slowly and carefully and timed my arrival at Amlagola at about six o'clock or at most half an hour later, just as it was getting too dark to see. To stay out after that would force the use of my torch, and realizing I was dealing with a very shy and crafty animal, I felt he was less likely to show himself then, and would probably prefer to launch his ambush at a time when he thought the traveler was unprepared. For the first mile or so, the pathway traverses beautiful park-like country, and here peacocks, which had just begun to grow their new plumage after dropping their tail feathers subsequent to the mating season, grubbed under the bushes and flapped heavily skywards as I appeared around a corner. Gradually the vegetation grew more dense, the trees higher and the undergrowth thicker. After the second mile, I could only see the track ahead and snatch a quick glance around at it behind me. To my left and right a wall of impenetrable green hid everything more than a yard away from sight. The dangerous valley about which I have spoken, where the Gandnorai had thrice launched his ambushes, still lay three miles ahead, beginning at about the fifth mile along the track I had come, with another three miles to my destination, Amlagola. The closer I approached this valley, the more dense became the vegetation. Actually, this sort of jungle is not favored by tigers as a rule, who prefer the park-like country I had already come through. Bison, elephant, sambar and barking deer are at home here, the felines choosing the more open jungles where their main prey, such as spotted deer, wild pig, and of course village cattle, graze on the plentiful grass that grows there. It was another indication of the Gaundnorai's craftiness that had induced him to change from the habit of his species to haunt a place affording him the maximum cover for his ambushes. At last I tipped down the foot of the hill, the base of which marks the start of the Valley of Death. It is three quarters of a mile, or perhaps seven furlongs, to the point where the path starts climbing the next hill, and dense bamboos with lush undergrowth press heavily upon the narrow trail on both sides. I halted for a moment to pick up a handful of sand, which I raised to shoulder level and then allowed to trickle slowly from my fingertips. There was little breeze, but what there was carried the sand earthward slightly to my left. The wind was therefore blowing from right to left, and the tiger, if he attacked, would almost certainly do so from the left-hand side of the track and not from the right. My deduction was based upon a fundamental law of the jungle. Felines prey upon deer and such creatures as have a keen sense of smell. To do so upwind would render their stalk abortive, for the currents of air would betray their presence and their quarry would escape. Carnivores have therefore learned by instinct always to approach downwind, that is against the wind, so that their own scent will not give them away before they can attack. Unlike deer, the human being has practically no sense of smell so far as self-preservation is concerned, and the average person would not be able to scent a tiger or a panther, even in hiding a yard away, whatever the direction of the wind. But the feline does not know this and so applies the same rules to stalking a man as it would to stalking any other jungle creature. For this reason, I was almost sure that the Gandnorai, if he came for me, would attack from the left. And being the coward that he was, ten chances to one from behind me. Having established all this by reasoning, I began to walk silently forwards along the track, alert for anything that might happen. The first quarter mile or so was fraught with apprehension. Every little while I glanced backwards to see if I was being followed. Once, as I looked back, I was in time to see a bush I had just passed sway violently, then come to rest. I swung around. I knew that I could not see beneath the bush, it was far too thick. But I could watch the top of it. A tiger cannot spring out of the middle of a bush, it has to creep forwards to break clear of its branches before he makes its leap, 
and when it creeps the tops of the bushes will shake. If you keep watching the tops of the branches you will be able to see them move, then you will know it is coming. Sure enough the top of one of the branches very near the edge of the pathway shook slightly as something brushed against its base. This is it, I said to myself, and raised the point 405 to my shoulder. A moment later the branch vibrated more noticeably and out walked a wild boar into full view. Seeing me suddenly, it swerved head on, the bristles on its neck rising like spines, head bent low with tusks aimed at me, small red eyes looking upward angrily. I felt like laughing, but sighed with relief. The fact of the boar appearing from my left indicated that the tiger was not in the immediate vicinity. Noticing that I stood motionless and made no move towards him, the boar decided that I must be harmless after all, although something to be regarded with grave suspicion. With head still bent at an angle to keep me in view and charge if necessary, the pig crossed the track to plunge into the thickets on the right with a loud brushing of the leaves. The next instant it was gone. This time I really sighed. I went on again, relief making me a trifle less cautious perhaps, and was soon within reach of the end of the valley. I saw nothing in front of me. I looked back, but nothing was there. I looked in front again, when something urged me to turn around. And there was the Gauntnori, or rather his head, emerging from a wall of green to my left that I had just passed. Not a sound had he made. My rifle came to my shoulder and I squinted down the barrel. But the tiger was no longer there to aim at. Instinct and his inherent cowardliness warned him that here was no defenseless passerby. He vanished as silently as he came. Confidence made me bold, and I stepped forward to catch a glimpse of him, if possible. A low growl, and then the rustle of leaves several yards away in the undergrowth, told me that the big tiger would not stay to fight. He was running away. I arrived at Amlagola shortly before dark to recount my adventure to an astonished Ramia. I did not know quite what to do the next day. Ramia said it was useless to tie out cattle as bait, for the Gandnori would not look at them. In any case, there were very few cattle in Amlagola, and none of their owners would sell for this purpose. I would have to wait to walk back to Tagarthi the following morning if I wanted to buy a bait. That afternoon the Gandnori broke his own rule. Perhaps he was over hungry. Maybe he thought the valley was too dangerous for him to haunt for a while, with me in it. So he killed a man in the park-like jungle I have told you about, a mile or so from the Tagarthi forest rest house where I had left my car. The victim's three companions came hurriedly through the valley to bring me the news. They knew it was safe enough to traverse while the tiger was engaged in eating this kill. It was nearly three in the afternoon when they arrived and I had seven miles to cover to reach the site of the incident. We found what was left of the man a little after 4.30. The Gauntnori had attacked his victim in the expected fashion from behind a bush, out of the center of which grew a wild cashew tree, killed him and carried him back to the same bush, behind which he had set to work and eaten more than half the body. The three men who had been walking in front of the victim had practically run the rest of the way to Amligola. The wild cashew tree growing on the spot was a very lucky factor. Its many branches and large leaves made the construction of a machin a quick and easy matter. Although I made a bet with myself that the Gandnori would never show up, because he was far too cunning for one thing, while the noise the men made in building the Macken, in spite of all their efforts to work silently, must have been heard by him where he lay, probably not very far away, there was always the slimmest chance that he might appear. By six o'clock I was in the Macken, quite a snug affair considering the short time in which it had been made, and the three men hurried back the mile to Tagarthi which they had covered that morning in the company of the unfortunate man now lying mangled behind the bush. This was the Indian spring and it soon began to grow dark. Within another hour the remains of the corpse on the ground beneath me was hidden from sight. There was no moonlight and I was relying upon the torch, clamped to the barrel of my rifle, to light the scene if the tiger returned. All was silent for nearly an hour except for the calls of a few night birds and the flapping of the large fruit bats around the tree. I glanced at the luminous dial of my watch. It was 8 o'clock the time when tigers generally return to their kills. Almost punctually to the hour, a group of spotted deer began to call in alarm from the park-like jungle to the east. Their cries were dying away when an animal moved in the bush directly below me. The Gandnori had come. In another moment he could start to eat and then would be my chance. 
This was precisely the moment when I heard a tiger growl, but it was at least a hundred yards or more away, certainly not below me. So the Gan nor I had a companion. This fact raised complications. Was this the man-eater after all? I remembered his cowardliness. Maybe another tiger was the true man-eater. Or perhaps both had the habit. My thoughts were interrupted when the animal below me snarled, then dashed off at top speed. After that I heard neither of the tigers and thought they both had gone when, a few minutes before nine o'clock, a twig snapped and this was followed by the crunching of bones. One of the tigers had returned. So I slowly raised the rifle to my shoulder in preparation for a shot. An instant later pandemonium broke out. A series of shattering roars came from the darkness a short distance behind me, a coughing snarl issued from directly below, and this was followed by the sound of a large body frantically clawing its way up the trunk of the tree upon which I was sitting. At about the same instant a second body crashed against the tree, which shook under the impact, and started tearing at the trunk. The tree swayed as if struck by a hurricane and I felt I would be hurled out of the Macken. Roars, growls and snarls from below my very feet threw me into panic. Hastily pointing the rifle barrel downwards, I pressed the torch button. The light cut through the night and fell upon a panther, only two feet below. But it was gazing downwards. I moved the barrel slightly, and now, I looked into the blazing eyes of the Gaundnorai, who would never have had the courage to attack the tree on which I was hiding had not the panther, stealing from the kill, thought fit to take refuge in it. Neither animal knew the tree was already occupied by me. The first was an easy shot, between the eyes. The Gaundnorai fell backwards as his roars came to an end. So was the second. The panther looked up in startled amazement to provide another easy shot, also between the eyes. I could not afford to spare him, though I would have liked to do so. He had been eating from a human kill and might turn into a man-eater himself. The Gaundnorai was perhaps the largest tiger I have ever shot, and surely the most cowardly.